Like I said, that's people not either not being here or not paying attention to That's what I was using my pure notes to pay and look for that. I know what it is. I get out of this class and then I'm going to You know, that's the best thing in the world. I'm going to try to go check on another. Oh, yeah, well, that means I have to put my name on the front page by my name. Sorry, my name for me. I guess Really? One more week. because we're already doing our grades. And then you have a test when? When's your so-called final? exactly the same size as the others. The only thing is you don't have notes, you don't have you just have to sit in here and take it like a regular test. Uh, Did you have a class saw your hand? Yeah, can we turn in the um, last night assignment early? Yeah, I guess so, sure. I don't mind that, yeah. Um, sometimes I don't want to take them early, but yeah, sometimes it's okay since we've got the test here. If you want to turn it in early, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so Basically, take a line up, take a line like, like a man. No more take on. Finally, got to do a, another real test. Okay, so hang on, I'm checking something right here. Okay, so we had two. Okay, you have two and two. That's the way I thought it worked out. All right, so anyway, um, we're going to finish up something. There's just a couple things, even though you already turned the test in, you know, about this. Finish this up for just a few minutes, not the whole thing. There's a couple things I want to show you, call your attention to in chapter nine that we didn't get to. We've gotten, yeah, we've gotten through um, some of the Gothic architecture and stuff. But I want to tell you a little bit about Abelard and Heloise real quickly because that's so important. Uh, this was a, a really important story. He ended up 
um, getting this. He was a tutor, a professor actually at the time at the University of Paris, and he ended up um, leaving, and he, he moved in as a tutor to this young woman. That was very unusual, because women didn't really have, at that time, education, and it was her uncle, Fulbert, who was able to actually get her this education, okay, because she wanted it. Now, she became pregnant, he proposed to her, and so on. They got secretly married, right? Now, he decides at, at this point, that, you know, they're married in the eyes of God and they don't tell anyone and so on. Well, finally, though, her uncle Fulbert decides that, you know, he's heard a rumor that they're married and that he figures it out. She denied it, but then Abelard sent her away to protect her from her uncle who was furious at her for being pregnant. Now, the story also goes that he, you know, Fulbert thought she was pregnant without being married and then there was a lot of stuff because the problem was Abelard wanted to continue you know, raising his rank in the church. You can't do that if you're married, right? So the story varies a little bit, but it ends with the castration. Now, the castration is not the type of castration we think of today. In this, in this era, they're going to completely cut off all of his private parts, everything. Okay, not testicles, but everything's gone. Now, again, the story is pretty rotten, pretty terrible. Uh, you can read the story in the, the letters of Abelard and Heloise. You can read the story in many variations. But what happens at that point, then, is he becomes a monk. And he insists that Heloise takes vows as a nun, so she can't marry anyone else. He can't marry anyone else. They can never be together again. You know, he says he couldn't be a man, and so they could never be together again. Now, she didn't want to do that, but what happens that's so interesting about this sort of sad story is that they were both in service to the church, but they never got back together again. They were never able to, um, to, to really get together and, and express their love. What they did was they wrote letters through the years. Many of the letters, they would start out talking about God and the church. She became an abbotist. An abbotist. She was head of a, of a you know, rather powerful convent, and he was a, you know, he continued to rise up. But anyway, sometimes we present this as a great tragic love story because they're never able to be together. Now, Bernard of Clairvaux was his opponent, you know, and you don't have to know too much about that. But I do want to talk a little bit about Dante, just because it's, it's awesome and cool and you need to hear it. Even though it was mentioned on the test before we talked about it, you still need to hear a little bit from me about Dante because it was Dante's the great Italian poet. And he had written this great work called La Commedia, or the Comedy. Okay. Now the Church is eventually going to call it the Divine Comedy later, after you know, after Dante's death, because he talks about very church-like things. Okay. He talks about purgatory. Okay. Very Catholic idea of this place where you must be purged of your sins. Talks about inferno, hell, and paradiso, which is heaven. Now here's the thing. Okay. You're going to have Dante, at the beginning of the story, it's written in the first person. And Dante is going to talk about, in the very beginning, one of the very first lines in La Commedia is in, how did he put this? He said, in the middle of our life, I found myself in a dark wood, something like that. Now, in the middle of our life sounds a little, you know, you have to, this is why I'm glad I actually had never read it until I was in you know, graduate school and had somebody to explain some of it to me because it's really quite difficult reading, just like the Aeneid. Okay, in the middle of our life, what he was saying was the biblical age expectation, the life expectation, lifespan is about 70. So he was saying that he was about 35 in the middle of our life. Okay, he says, I found myself in a dark wood and couldn't escape. And so what he meant was that he had lost his way lost his way from the path of, of righteousness. And he ends up, you know, he's in this dark wood in the story, and he sees a light over there. And he's trying to go back to the light, and he can't get there. And there's all these animals that are in his way that are blocking him. Each one of those animals, I can't remember all of them right now, but you'll have several animals, like a wolf, a lion, and so on. And each one of them will represent one of what he perceived to be one of his sins. Okay? Greed. And, and whatever else, you know, whatever kinds of sins that he felt he had committed. Now, he sees, though, as he's standing there in this dark wood, trying to get over back to the path, he sees someone coming toward him, a man comes toward him, and that man is a guy you've heard of before. This is Virgil, okay? 
Virgil, the guy who wrote the Aeneid, okay, this is Dante's actual favorite author, is like his his rock star author, right? Dante calls Virgil the light and glory of all poets, my teacher, my lord, and law, and he falls down to his knees when he sees Dante. Now, here's the thing: Dante is going to guide, or is going to be guided by Virgil through purgatory and hell. Dante cannot enter into heaven because Dante lived before Jesus. So according to, or Virgil cannot enter into heaven because Virgil lived before Jesus. Therefore, he was a pagan and he was forever cut off from God. Virgil becomes his guide and his teacher and he explains all these things. But Virgil is not going to be able to go, like I said, into heaven. So how's Dante going to get into heaven? Well, Dante is going to be led into heaven by a woman that he considered to be perfection. This was his unrequited love. That's always the best kind because you don't have to live with them and you don't know what they're really like, right? Okay? So the unrequited love, that's all. Do you ever have, have one from high school or something? You're like, oh. And you never really had to, yeah, you know what I'm saying. So he writes about her till the end of his life. She was pure perfection to him. She had died at age 24, married to someone else in childbirth. They had never been together. So he makes her his tour guide through heaven because she's perfect enough to go into uh, into the, the you know the chambers of God. Wow. Now, right here, all of a sudden he seen the day was added unto day as he who had the power had adorned heaven with a second son. Beatrice was standing with her eyes all fixed upon the eternal wheels, and I fixed my sight removed from there above on her. I think he was in love with her all of his life. He, he was. I mean, just constant, constant poetry about Beatrice. And then he makes her one of the great figures in the Western world literature, okay? A whole literature of the Western world. So she takes it through heaven. Now, the most important thing, though, that we get from Dante in many ways, since we don't have time to talk a lot about it, is the fact that whether you know it or not, <coughs> whether you care or not, most of the time when you think of hell, you're not thinking of the Bible. Most of the time, you're thinking of images from Dante, okay, from Dante's Inferno, from his writings. Okay, what he did was he took the references in hell, or to hell in the Bible, and expanded it into some really, really, really graphic things, okay? So Dante's Inferno. Now, this is a simple one right here. Whoops, sorry. This is a simple one I'm gonna show you right here just really quickly, is, Okay, yeah, it's the last one on there. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going to go through it just really quickly, but what happens is there's Dante and Virgil up at the top. So Virgil, it turns out that Dante has had several women in heaven who were praying for him, who were asking, you know, God to, to send someone to get him back on the right path. So one of them was Beatrice, and the other, I think, I think that one of the others was Mary, you know, mother of Jesus and so on. But anyway, Dante and Virgil are getting ready to go in at this point into hell. So you enter into hell through this vestibule. See, it's like this foyer into hell. Now, what resides in the vestibule to hell? Basically, the souls of the feudal, people who are never going to choose between God and, and Lucifer, okay? Just the ambivalent ones, okay? <clears throat> as well as the ambivalent angels. So the feudal, the, the ambivalent angels, they're not going to be punished. In that vestibule up there, you're not going to have punishment. You're not going to be burning in fire or any of that kind of stuff, brimstone and all that. That It gets worse the further down you go. But you can be in that entryway to hell. And if I'm not mistaken, he puts, it's either right there in the vestibule, I think it's the vestibule, that he puts the current pope when he was writing. He put the pope right there in hell. And the Pope was alive when he put him in there. So he was making a very political statement, okay? Now, first circle of hell, unbaptized children, pre-Christ honorable men. Guys like Virgil and Homer, for example, okay, writer of the Iliad and the Odyssey, supposedly, and so on. Those guys live, if I'm not mistaken, it's been, it's been a few years since I read this, because like I said, it's very, it's very cumbersome to read. But if I'm not mistaken, they're living in this big mansion, they're in the first circle of hell. Because when you think of hell, again, you're thinking down here with all this horrible stuff. At first, you know, the vestibule of the first circle, you've got unbaptized children. They're in limbo, okay? The only thing is they're cut off from God, but they're not being tortured. They haven't been baptized. 
in the Catholic Church. Pre-Christ honorable men like Virgil and Homer, they're living, hey, they're living in a mansion. They just can't go into, into heaven. They just can't leave hell. Okay, now second, second circle. Now this is really the cool thing. Uh, if we had a lot of time to talk about it, we would talk a lot about the concept of contrapasso, which is an Italian word, which means the punishment fits the crime. Dante does this better than anybody in hell because what he does is, and the best example is there in the second circle of hell. Now you have the lustful. So the punishment fits the crime. So what happens is there's this, um, there's this couple, Francesco and Paolo, who had had an affair when they were alive. Now when Dante sees these people, he calls them shades. I mean, they're ghosts. They're, they're the spirits of, of the people who pass on. But anyway, he meets up with Francesco and Paolo, and uh, one of them, I don't know, it was like a brother and sister-in-law, something they had. They had an affair. One of them was married to the other one's brother or something. But anyway, or sister, they had committed the sin of lustfuls. And forever and ever, what, what had happened in hell is that Paolo and Francesco were together as one. Okay, they were, they were combined into one shade, into one spirit forever. Now, in other words, hey, you wanted this guy, you've got him forever now. You can't get away from him. You wanted to take him away from his wife. Guess what? You got it forever. I had a girl one time, straight faced, said, that sounds sweet. And I said, have you ever been married? She's like, no, I said, I didn't think so. Because <laughs> you don't want to, no, you don't want that, okay? So that was part of the, that was part of the punishment, Gale Force wins and so on. And then as you go down further, you're going to see different punishments you can look at. Um, <clears throat> until you get down, I mean, it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Boiling blood. The fiery graves, I want to take a second and tell you, when he goes to the, he, he encounters and talks to these shades and asks them, hey, where are you from? You know, why are you here in hell? What did you do? And that type of thing. And he encounters these guys in the boiling, or not the boiling blood, but the fiery graves. And he's talking to them, and he'll be talking to a guy, and he's up to here, say up to his chest in the fire. And then Dante's talking to him, and the guy flips over and always sees it, or his feet. So forever, this guy, these guys, all these guys and you know, women, whoever, in the fiery graves, they're going to be spinning around. And, you know, forever, they're going to be, so they're never burned and consumed, but they're constantly burned and they can still feel it. But they don't want to leave your head out. They certainly don't want to leave your feet out. So you're going to be flipping all the time. So that, to me, was one of the most graphic images that I took away, besides Paolo and Francesca. Now, you've got, down here, you know, different punishments, serious criminals, heretics. Heretics are way down there going against the church. One thing that's fascinating to me is because it's such a Christian-based idea, he puts the river sticks in there, though, from the old mythology. Pagan mythology is in there. You have to cross the river sticks. We have four dragons. Now, down here at the end, though, the last thing I'll mention, is you have Lucifer. Strangely enough, Lucifer is in ice. Lucifer is in a big block of ice. Oh, that's why they made So that's what they made So I was going to say, somebody one time said, does that mean hell froze over? Well, Dante's got Lucifer in the big block of ice. Now, Lucifer, though, is going to have the three, what Dante considers the three worst traitors of all time. They're going to be down here with Lucifer. They're going to be dealing with Lucifer himself for all of eternity. Now, the three worst traitors of all time, I think Dante is a little bit short-sighted here, okay? Because what he did was he put, you know, first of all, he put Judas Iscariot. Okay, I can see that. Who was that guy? Oh, that guy. He betrayed Jesus yeah. for the 40 pieces or 30 pieces of whatever it was of silver, right? Yeah. So I can see that. But then the other two, the other two, again, I think, if I'm just going to pick three, the worst, three worst traitors of all time, I'm going to go a little deeper than these next two. Brutus and Cassius. Who did they betray? Julius Both Caesar. of them, Julius Caesar. Caesar. So I, just, yeah. I don't know. It seems a little short-sighted. But here's the punishment, okay? What they're going to do is they're going to be down there with Lucifer being tortured. Part of the torture is Lucifer has three heads. You can't see it on here. They don't portray it that way. But Lucifer in the book has three heads. Okay, And so in each one of his mouths, he'll be eating those traitors for all time. 
Okay, he'll grab them up, he'll eat them, and then digest them, and they come out again. And then he grabs them up and he eats them for all time. That's pretty rough, right? <coughs> Created, too. Now, the difference between hell and purgatory, there is a difference between hell and purgatory. The difference is that even in purgatory, even though you're having some horrible torture, you're doing, you're having some of these same types of things you're going through, you are doing it happily. You're like, oh, I'm burning, I'm burning, that's good, that's good. You're happy because what's at the end of purgatory? Heaven. Heaven. You're purging yourself from all sin so God can look upon you and bring you into heaven. The hell of Dante and the hell of Christianity is that in hell, these are the people who would never repent. And so they're just pissed off the whole time. They're like, oh, you're burning me forever. They're just getting angrier. Where in purgatory, they're saying, thank you for doing this to me. Thank you. It's purging me so I can go see God. So anyway, I just wanted to give you those little, just a couple of little quick insights there. Uh, even though you've already done that test, I still couldn't skip that completely. So right, we don't yeah. have to worry about nothing just on the test. Well, it's already, you've already turned that in that the test. test. You've already turned in that test, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's cool. That's good. All right. So let me see if I can get, grab up here real fast our um, next one. All right. So what we're doing today now is we're going to be talking about Chapter 10, which is all that the so-called final covers. Now, it's a lot of stuff, and you're not going to have notes, and I mentioned all that. A lot of stuff, and that's why I want to make sure that you don't take it for granted. That's not going to be, um, yeah, it's not going to be some easy little, even though it's one chapter, it's not going to be some easy little exam, because there's a lot of material in terms of chapter 10. So, hang on. While I'm doing this, do you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah, I watched Thanksgiving parade. I saw the Pikachu flow with the snow. Pika! Yeah, the Pikachu flow would have a little peek and mutton Pikachu snowman. Pikachu. Okay, yeah, I, I, I like Thanksgiving. I thought they would do something fun. I'm just kidding. Our family does pork chops for Thanksgiving because it makes it easier to eat it. Let me see, this should be the right one. Um, yeah, I always go to San Francisco to visit family every year, and sometimes end up with that same little issue playing. So come on. There we go. Yeah, Thanksgiving's all right. I've had. I had a really good time with my little great nephew because he's only five and he says, Aww. or four, he's not even quite five, he says the funniest things. And How can you not like little, little, little kids when they tell stories? <laughs> and I never wanted to come back when he and square got to see the big, the giant Christmas tree that put up in Eden Square every year at Thanksgiving. It's a lot of fun. Always fun. All this. Okay, well, anyway, we're going to be talking about. Um, from fear to hope, which is basically we have the story here is called the calamitous century. And a calamity, as you know, a calamity is not a good thing. Calamity is a very, um, very bad thing, negative connotation with calamity. But you also then see the subtitle from fear to hope. So we have a, we have a terrible war or a, actually a series of wars that's going to happen during this period, and we're going to see a lot of things coming from that war, but we're also going to see the church getting into some deep trouble in terms of their, well, their PR, in terms of their, um, I don't know, in terms of their their trust factor in the eyes of the people of Europe. The Catholic Church is going to have some issues at this time, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So really, we talk about the 1300s here, from fear to hope, and then we're going to have another PowerPoint that I'll put up about Black Death. 
But we're talking about what we call the calamitous century, but then at the end, we're moving toward you know, the Renaissance and things are going to get better. So we're talking about really the end of the Middle Ages here as we get into the 1300s. So medieval times are ending. Now, yeah, this one I definitely, I don't know, definitely don't like this one. Hang on, I'm sorry, I have to do this. I just don't like that one. That's not the best one. Why? Okay, but anyway, continue talking about it because I know it well enough. I can just continue talking about it. Okay, so what's going to happen is we're going to have three basic things going on. One of them is going to be the, um, the weather. There's going to be some strange things going on with the weather during the 1300s. We're going to talk about something called the Little Ice Age. That's going to be one of our major things we mentioned, and here's the Little Ice Age. And then we're going to talk about the church's problems, because the church, like I said, they, they start to lose the trust of the people. And we're going to talk about why they start to lose the trust of the people. We're also going to talk about the Hundred Years' War and the pestilence and famine and everything that goes along with having a war, or a series of wars, really, that were fought over such a long period of time. Now, again, when we talk about the Hundred Years' War, it's not going to be a hundred years of solid war. It's going to be 116 years of war, and then we'll stop a while, and then we'll fight again. So the hundred years war is going to be pretty incredibly powerful. Okay, in terms of giving us gunpowder, in terms of giving us many of our, um, you know, current weaponry, and some of our tactics start during that war. So again, start this one again. I think this is the one I like the best. Do we need any definitions? Um, you know, in here, I'll tell you what, the way, okay, if it was not the, the last time, or last day, and we didn't just, you know, last two days, and we, we're not just doing it over one chapter, I would say yes, but you know what, let me give you this. This exam, the one I'm going to give you, is only going to cover what we talked about in class. There's not going to be anything, any surprises, there's not going to be any little obscure anything. It's only going to be what we talk about in class. So basically study the PowerPoints and the notes and whatever you take. That's what you're going to need. You won't need anything extra. So that'll, I think that'll help you a lot, actually. Um, it's good that you brought that up. But yeah, that's, that's how I'm going to do it because I think it helps you a lot for the last one, especially since you guys have been spoiled to take them. Not that it helps everybody, but you know what I'm saying. Now, the 1300s. There's our three things right there. The weather, the famine pestilence that goes to the war, and the church problems. Now, that's bad times. So let's talk about, first of all, the weather. Now, this period here that we call the Little Ice Age, historians and scientists disagree about a lot of this. They can't figure out <coughs> exactly what caused it. They can't even figure out exactly when it happened. Some historians and some scientists have put it as late as lasting until the 1600s. Some people have it, you know, a lot of them have it back here in the 1300s. That's more typical. But again, there's a lot of disagreement upon, upon the Civil Ice Age. Now, what it basically is, it's not an ice age like you would think of in terms of a, a strict, you know, extremely low temperatures and, and freezing and glaciers everywhere and all that. It's not that. What it is, is basically a drop in temperature. In Northern Europe, I'm sorry, you guys know I'm sick because I usually get like 4,000 steps when I'm in here with you guys. I've got to sit down because I'm extremely, ugh. Okay, sorry about that. Now, unexpected drops in temperatures. It's going to happen in Northern France and Northern Germany, the areas that we call France and Germany today, most particularly. And what happens is a domino effect because we have this, this change in the weather. It's much colder than usual. Now, again, it varies as to where you are, but the domino effect means if you have not enough, say, water, or you have too much water, or you have not enough um, cultivate or, or um, you know, usable soil or whatever, then that's going to affect your crops. Same thing for the weather. If it's too hot or too cold, like I've tried to grow tomatoes since I've lived in Kentucky and I can't grow tomatoes. It's either too too wet or I don't put them in the right place and they get too much sun or they don't get enough sun or whatever. You know, something happens when, you, when you're trying to grow crops that you need certain conditions. And if you don't have them, it affects the amount of crops you have. 
So what they, what they find is from 13, 15, 16, and 17, some people put it a little bit later as well, but they have what we call the Great Famine. As a result of these, these you know, cold temperatures, they weren't able to grow enough food to feed everybody. Now, what we see, not for the first time, certainly not for the last time in European history, we see people that are going out and eating anything they can find. They're eating the bark off the trees, they're eating the grass, they're eating anything they can find. Now, <coughs> today, you know, we, we see people going and eating, you know, you said you smell McDonald's earlier. You know, you, you see people eating McDonald's all the time or fast food or whatever all the time. You can be fat and happy and sassy and still be malnourished if you eat junk, right? Same thing. Bark on the tree is not going to help you. You could eat this paper if you wanted to. It's not going to give you nourishment. So what we see is widespread malnourishment. At the same time, you, you don't eat. At the same time, you're wondering if they're going to cry because mushrooms can give you that slight high as well. It depends on the depends on the type, I think. Yeah. But any mushrooms, mm, whatever's growing. But malnourishment, you don't have enough um, you don't have enough nutrition to protect you, so your immune system starts to go south. And I don't know, maybe that's one reason I got sick, because when we were out there, you know, Thanksgiving, all we ate pretty much was junk after Thanksgiving. So you get your immunity down, and then you're susceptible to everything, whether it's just a common cold, whether it's just, you know, some kind of bacterial infection, whether it's whatever. One thing is for certain, if you don't eat right, you don't exercise enough, you don't sleep enough, when you guys are young enough, it's not going to affect you as much. But when you hit about 30 and 35, you start to slow down a little and you say, ooh, you know, man, my immunity. Well, what we saw back here was I mean, it was affecting the old, it was affecting the young, it was affecting everyone in between. There's not enough food. So, again, we call that the Great Famine. Now, that made you susceptible to things, not strictly the Black Death, but many other pestilences. Now, pestilence, that's a really fancy word for disease. So people were getting all kinds of different diseases caused by filth, caused by um, just everything, caused by bacteria and viruses and things that they didn't know anything about. So pestilence is easily spread back then. So we're going to talk more about the black hole. We're going to talk a lot more about the black death. But that's, that's the main thing here. It's the domino effect. Meanwhile, the church. Now, the black death and everything that goes along with the black death is going to have a negative effect on the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. So before we get to all that, let's just talk about some of their basic issues at this time. Now, the basic issues of the Roman Catholic Church at this time, you may or may not know if you're Roman Catholic, you probably know that when they pick a new pope, it has to be unanimous in the College of Cardinals. It has to be unanimous. Okay? You see today, this is a medieval thing, and today we can watch it on CNN or whatever when they go into vote, if they have not agreed unanimously on a pope, then you see, coming out of the Vatican, you see the building there, you see black smoke. smoke. And once they've agreed, what do you see? White smoke. White smoke. And everybody across the world is like, oh, they've elected a new pope. And, you know, we've seen that. If you're old enough, <coughs> I know, um, I know Terry and I can definitely remember because it's not been that long since two of them. Yeah. Like, really clearly two of them were elected and we saw the smoke coming out. But this is a medieval thing. It's part of the Roman Catholic Church and their ties to tradition. So they elect this guy. He becomes Pope Celestine V. Now, the problem with Celestine V is he didn't want to be Pope. He was a monk. And he was unanimously elected. And they said, well, God has picked you. That's why they have to be unanimous, OK? It's got to be the idea that God has chosen this guy. So he did not want to be Pope. He said, I don't want to be Pope, but I guess if God wants me to be, I'll be Pope. Well, one of the first things he did was he issued a papal bull. Okay, bull, just like the animal, right? Bull, B-U-L-L. -L. That means a, a very important document from the Pope, like an edict or a law from the Pope. He issues a papal bull or a papal decree saying that the Pope is allowed to quit 
Now, that's only happened, what, three times, I think, in history? I forget. It's either, it's either three or maybe four, because we forget about it. Because it happened just a few years ago, within the past, what, six years or so? It happened. You had, um, you know, throughout history, very few. Just like a Supreme Court justice, just like, you know, usually this is something that you're going to hold on to for life. Well, Pope Celestine never wanted it, so he quit. Now, the thing is, he was a monk. He lived a simple life. He loved to live out in the forest. He loved to be alone, commune with nature. And that was why he quit. He wanted to go back to the simpler life. Now, it turns out, though, that his the guy that comes after him, his friend Boniface, or the guy who becomes Pope Boniface VIII, Boniface VIII was probably, we think, okay, Boniface, all right, here, here's the story about Boniface VIII. That's his papal name. He wanted to be pope. That was his that was his, his goal. He wanted to be pope. So there's some evidence that Boniface the Eighth was talking to Celestine and telling him, you know, if you don't want to be pope, you're the pope. If you issue a decree saying that you can quit, you can quit. And we think that, that he encouraged that. Now, Pope Boniface the eighth, or, or this guy Boniface became Pope Boniface the eighth, and in order to make sure there was no split in the Catholic Church, because the very important thing is you can only have one pope at a time. When the pope speaks on matters of morality and faith, he is considered to be infallible, okay, the doctrine of infallibility of the pope. So we can't have two popes. You can't have two popes, okay? It's not going to happen. Well, we're going to see it did happen, but it's not supposed to happen. So what he does, what Pope Boniface VIII does, is he imprisons Celestine for the rest of his life. The poor guy just wanted to go back to live in the forest and have a simple life, and he is in prison. Now, again, we don't really have prisons the way we think of them today. He's imprisoned in a monastery where he can't leave. He has to stay there for the rest of his life. So he can't come out and say, you know what, I'm actually the Pope. Okay? He's put away from the people. Now, Pope Boniface VIII is thrilled to be Pope. He loves it. Okay? In the year 1300, he formalizes, he, he creates something that had come from the Old Testament. And he makes it a modern thing for them at the time, the 1300s. The year 1300s, he said this would be the Jubilee year. He says this is a year that if you come to Rome, you make a pilgrimage to Rome as a Christian, you are forgiven of all your sins. Universal pardon means that you're forgiven of all your sins. Okay? So what he did was he offered this blanket forgiveness. Now, why do you think he wants people to come to Rome in particular? What's he going to get out of it? Maybe not personally, maybe personally. Yeah, money. Because even though today, even though today when we go and we travel somewhere, we're going to have to spend money, even though I, you know, again, I just went and stayed with family in Northern California, and I didn't have to spend any money on lodging, but there are many other things you still have to spend money on, right? You're, if you want to buy something, you want to buy a souvenir, you want to buy this, you want to buy something for your kid or your friend or whatever, you're still going to spend money, even if, you know, whatever. So people back then, it's the same thing. They had inns that you could stay in. There's food that you have to purchase you're going to see money coming into Rome. And that's what he wanted because that helps the church. Now, another part of Boniface VIII and his goal is that he wants to reunite Europe under his control. Remember the Pope before the Concordat of Worms had a lot of power. Before you had the lay investiture controversy, which was ended by the Concordat of Worms in 1122, the Pope had such control, such power, that you had the emperors, you had like... Remember Henry IV, and you had Gregory over there, the Pope Gregory and Henry IV, to the point where the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire came and supposedly stayed outside in the cold for a day or two in snow to get back in the church. That's how powerful the papacy was. Well, the papacy had started to kind of, you know, the, the church itself had started to kind of not be as powerful over a little bit of time. What he wants is he wants the European heads of state to look to him, the Pope, as the final, the final say in everything, okay? So he wants to bring things back to where the, the church controlled everything because it was starting to get away from them. So what he does in 1302, 
Tish is a papal bull. Remember, an edict, a decree, a very important document, a law from the Pope for the Catholics or the Church. Okay? This is called <coughs> the Unum Sanctum, if you know Latin or even if you know just a tiny little bit of Latin or don't even know you, you know Latin. You can see universe, you can see university, you can see unum, the uni, the un has to do with one, okay? One. Unum sanctum, sanctification, it has to do with going to heaven, right? Cleansing of yourself for, for you to go to heaven through the church. Now, in 1302, Boniface says in the unum sanctum, there's only one church, the Roman Catholic Church. There is no salvation outside of the church. Without the Roman Catholic Church, you will go to hell. Okay, that's pretty clear. That's pretty clear. Okay. Now he says, and remember, if you're a Roman Catholic in 1302, if you're a serious Roman Catholic and you really believe in the church and God and the papacy, you're going to believe that he's infallible. Okay? He's not just making this up if you're a Roman Catholic at this time. He's telling you, you have got to get in line with the church. You're going to hell without the church. You have to follow our doctrines now. Who's he talking to mainly? Not the rank and file, because most of us, I mean, he's not worried about us. He's talking about the leaders, the kings, the emperors. Remember, he wants to unite everything under his control. Now, he tells them in the Unum Sanctum, you can read that, it's easy to look up, but he says that there are two realms. There's a spiritual realm, and then there's the temporal or the temporal, the material world. And we've heard that before when we talked about the, the four big church fathers and so on. We heard that. But that's a common thing. Okay? Remember when St. Augustine he wrote about the city of God. There's the spiritual world that we should be thinking of, and then there's the temporary and the material world. Okay? The temporal or the temporal leaders, temporary world, material world, they must recognize the authority of the Pope because the word of the Pope comes from God. Now, the problem he has, it's kind of funny, but the problem he has is in very, very Roman Catholic France. Okay, remember Catholic France has been Roman Catholic since the 500s or the late 400s. And so you wouldn't think that he would have as much trouble in France, but he does. Philip IV, also known as Philip the Fair, okay, king of, of France at the time, decides that Boniface is not acting in the interest of God. In other words, Philip is not accepting the Roman Catholic doctrine at that time of the papacy, of the infallibility of the Pope. He wants to get rid of the Pope. Okay, that's called, just like with a king or an emperor, it's called deposition or deposing. Okay, don't make a mis mistake on, I tell you this a lot of times, don't make a mistake on a test or anything of saying disposing. You're not disposing of them, that's garbage, okay? You're deposing, you're removing them from their throne or their power. See? So he tries to depose Boniface. And what Philip does, Philip IV hires really, uh, hires some, some, some thugs to go and beat up the Pope. Okay, now Boniface VIII, is an old man. He's not a young pope. He's an old man. He's not in good health. And so Denagare, Denagare is one of the guys. You have another guy, Colonna, and they're going to go and they're going to rough up the pope. This is a famous portrayal of the striking of the pope. You see the guy with his with his hand drawn back. He's going to smack the pope. They kind of beat him up. Okay. What happens is poor Boniface is going to die fairly soon after that. It's going to scare him to death. It's going to terrify him. Okay, so you have Philip the Fourth putting the fear in actually the papacy into the Pope. Now what we see here, <coughs> okay, okay. So we're gonna have um, we're gonna have a time where there's a little bit of a question as to how the papacy is run. But from 1309, at that point. Philip the Fair decides that he is going to bring the papacy, okay, bring the Pope, the papacy, and everything that goes with the Pope, you know, cardinals, everything. He's going to bring them to a French territory called Avignon. Avignon is the territory of France, okay, and this period we call the Avignon papacy because what happens is the Pope 
There's going to be a few of them. But the Pope is going to be from 1309 to 1377, however many popes there are in that period of time, they're all going to be under the thumb, under the control of the French kings. Because the French kings, they want popes that they can say, hey, you know, I want you to declare this. I want you to do things to help France. I want you to help the emperor. What the Avignon papacy does, basically, is you're going to have a few French kings and a few popes that from 1309 to 1377 that are going to work together in a corrupt way. And this corruption is not going to help the people of, of Europe look at the church in a, a more positive way. It's going to make things much worse. Because the Avignon popes, they're going to get everything they want. Imagine today if you had someone extremely wealthy, you had like a king, you had a you know, a president, an emperor, somebody who could say, okay, I want to control the Pope. And you actually got the Pope to go along with that and give them anything they want. Imagine today it would be it would be fast cars, it would be just I mean imagine just whatever kind of elaborate things your imagination could give you. And here's the palace. Let me show you just briefly the palace. This is the Avignon Papacy Palace, the palace where they lived. Look at that. This is quite the luxurious place, okay? So we've got the Avignon Papacy. We've got a bunch of popes and their cardinals and everyone in the papal bureaucracy that are answering not to God, not to the church, but to the French kings. Okay, they're not answering for the people for, you know, the way they're supposed to, supposedly from God. They're answering to the kings who want them to do very specific things. Now, again, they get anything they want. They're spoiled. So they become materialistic. You know, if, you, if you're very poor, if you've ever lived and you've been very poor, you learn how you can get by with certain things. And you learn at some point, and sometimes until you never have, until you have it, you don't miss it. But let's say you've been very poor, and then you've got some money for a while, and then maybe you're back to being very poor. That would be pretty rough on anybody. Well, imagine the popes. The popes are getting spoiled. Now, what we see, though, is one guy is going to buck the system. This is going to be Gregory XI in 1378. Pope Gregory XI says, you know what? This is not right. We're not speaking on behalf of the church. We're taking the French kings, and we're just doing their will. We have betrayed God. We've betrayed the church, and we've betrayed the people of Europe. So you know what? <clears throat> We're going back to Rome. Well, Gregory XI was not all that happy when he found that everybody was not on board with that. A lot of the cardinals, a lot of the, the, the parts of the papacy don't want to go back to Rome. They like being spoiled. I mean, you can imagine why. They like getting whatever they want. They like the palace. So it's going to make, after his death, it's going to make a new pope, putting in a new pope, very difficult because you have cardinals in Avignon, France, and you have cardinals in Rome. Now, this is where it gets weird. Remember, you should only have one pope because according to the Catholic Church, then the pope is getting his word from God. You should only have one pope. What if you don't? That causes what we call a schism or a schism or a break or a, something terrible. In this case, the great Western break in the church. The Roman Catholic Church will recover from this, but it will not be easy. Okay, now here's what happens. I, this, is not all, this is not all written up there. Let me just tell you basically what happens, okay? 1378, Gregory XI moves back to Rome. Some of the cardinals go with him, and then he passes away can't remember what year he passed away, but let me tell you, it started a huge controversy and a break. And what happens is we have cardinals in Avignon, cardinals in Rome, that each elect a pope. So there's a pope in Rome, there's a pope in Avignon, France, and each one of the popes says that he is the legitimate pope. Each one of them. All right, so I am the real pope, you're not. No, I'm the real pope, you're not. They excommunicate each other, which I think is funny. I don't know why. It just strikes me as hilarious. Each pope excommunicates the other as if they have the power to do that because who knows who the real, the real pope is? Nobody knows who God wanted in that position. 
because we've got people here and people there, and they each come to unanimous decision on their own. Now, what happens is that goes on for years, goes on until 1414. Okay. Now, it really it, it, it truly ends in 1417. But the Council of Constance, this is what's going to end the Great Western Bray, is and I call it Bray because it's a lot easier to say than the other. Part, but the Bray, and that's what it is. But the Council of Constance starts meeting in 1414. You have different guys, different cardinals, different groups, different you know bishops and archbishops and all these different guys that are coming. <coughs> excuse me. That are coming together to try to figure this out, okay? They meet, and they meet for about two and a half years. So they start in 1414, and by 1417, they've completely ended. Now, here's the funny part, though. I think this is really just even funnier than having two popes excommunicating each other. There's a while in there that they have a third pope. Finally, you know, both sides, that they each got their own pope, and they say, all right, you know what? We're going to elect a new pope. And the Pope in Avignon and the Pope in Rome, each of those guys said, nope, I'm not going to step down. I'm the real Pope. No, I'm the real Pope. Then you have the third guy that says, wait a minute, I'm the real Pope. I excommunicate both of you. And vice versa. And it all, it, again, it's a big mess. The Catholic Church almost just completely died at this point in terms of their in terms of their leadership, in terms of what could have happened. Somehow or other, they put it together. And in the end, where they had three popes, eventually they figure we've got to, you know, we've got to find a man who will satisfy everybody. That's very difficult. You know, anybody that you're going to elect is probably going to make someone angry, or they're going to want their own guy or something because it's gone that far. It's gone that far. So what they end up with is this guy, Pope Martin V, who looks like looks like Uncle Fester if you've ever seen the Adams Family. Kind of looks like Uncle Fester. Yeah, it's a little bit like Uncle Fester from the Adams family to me. But Pope Martin V, once he's elected, he's he supposedly is going to be more malleable, more more agreeable to both sides, and, and, and everybody is sort of willing to go along with him. And finally, they're able to get rid of the other popes, and things come back together. Okay, so the church is saved at this point, but it was very close to just completely breaking apart. Okay, so. Great, the great break, the great western break, or schism, or schism, the church is over. Meanwhile, while all that's going on, we've got the Hundred Years' War. Now, like I said earlier, the Hundred Years' War is not a Hundred Years' War. It's one of those things that, that historians, that we just, we, we put a, a title on it that's easier for people who are not that interested in history to look at it and say, yeah, okay, that sounds better than saying, well, it was a series of related conflicts for about 116 years. You'd be like, hey, I don't hear all that. Just call it, give it a simple name. So we call it the Hundred Years' War. Okay, it's actually, again, lots of different truces are going to be signed and they'll fight again and then they'll start and stop and start and stop. But here's the reason that we call it that we're able to call it one war if we want to, is because the, the, the belligerents are the same. It's between England and France. Okay, it's always it's between England and France. That's who's fighting. Okay? So again, it's, it's, it's 116 years from 1337 to 1453. Remember, 1453 is an important year. The Hundred Years' War ends. Also, this is where you have the, um, the taking of, of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks. And the old Byzantine Empire is going to fall in 1453. So there's a lot of things going on in this particular time. Now, the Hundred Years' War, so many important things going on. But who gets the brunt of it? Well, it's between England and France, and France is going to get most of the fighting. Okay? France is going to get most of the fighting when it comes right down to it. It was fought primarily on their land. That means that the farmers, that means the peasantry of France, they were harmed the most. Now, what we see here, though, when we look back at the Hundred Years' War, is what were the important factors and important things that came out of this, this series of conflicts? Well, you're going to have the introduction of new weapons and tactics. New weapons, we're talking gunpowder, we're talking guns, we're talking cannons. This is the first time we've got these type of things. Also, 
You're going to have, and we'll talk about some of the others, but you're also going to have the first actual standing armies since the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, back in the 400s, early 500 times. You hadn't had standing armies. Remember, you had during feudalism, you had the vassals, and we had, you know, the Lord who could call these vassals together. We're going to start to see the countries here, England and France, building up professional standing militaries to protect themselves and to fight. Now, it's viewed as one of the most important conflicts in medieval warfare. I always say it's, to me, from what I have always ascertained, I think it's probably the most important conflict in medieval times, not only because of <coughs> the new weapons and the standing armies and all of this, but the fact that, that it has such an impact in countries much further away than just the two belligerents that are fighting, England and France. I mean, it's in a, the, the, the things that happened during the Hundred Years' War are going to reverberate into many other places, into the German territories, over into some of the Spanish regions, and so on. Okay? So it's very important in many ways. So let's talk about it. Now, in the beginning here, I don't want you to get too bogged down with all of these names. Okay? I don't want you today to sit here and try to figure out, well, Okay, don't do this. What I used to do, I told you guys this before probably, but I would sit there in calculus class and really didn't like calculus, was not the least bit good at it. And I would sit there in class and when the professor would do it on the board, I'd say, yeah, that looks right. I understand that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh -huh, I got it. I got it. And then I'd go home and I would get out something and I would say, hmm, I have no idea what this is, right? It's where you have to kind of learn to take notes. You have to also, though, besides taking notes, you have to also give yourself a little bit of space between things. You can't expect to hear all this stuff in an hour and whatever, 15 minutes. You can't expect to hear all this stuff and then go home and say, yeah, I know it all. I know, I know all of this. I know it because I heard it once. I heard it once. I heard it once. Okay, you're not gonna you're not gonna memorize all these guys. You're not gonna memorize all these these people and names of, of you know why they're significant or, or um, not just the names but why they're significant. Their impact on the Hundred Years' War as well as the hereditary aspects. So listen to what I'm saying in here, but then go home and study it because there's a lot of people right here that are important to this in ter in terms of the family tree. Okay, now what leads to the Hundred Years' War? It all starts over in France. Of course it does. France has always got something going on, right? We have the Capetian dynasty. Now, if you go back a little further, you might remember we had the Carolinians. If you go back a little further, you might remember we had the Merovingians, okay? And the Merovingians who were overthrown then by the Carolinians and so on. Well, the Carolinians are going to be overthrown by the Capet family, the Capetian dynasty. Now, these guys are going to make up the oldest continuous dynasty in medieval Europe. In other words, they're going to have guys on the throne for the longest period of time. Now, 987, 13, 28. Now, right here, we have our friend Philip the Fair, the guy, <coughs> the guy who was king of France when the Unum Sanctum came out, the guy who uh, yeah, had the Pope beaten up and the Pope ends up dying and all that stuff, the guy that brings the Avignon papacy. You know, brings that into, into being. Philip the Fair, he dies in 1314. Now, hang on, give me a second. Let me show you the family tree. Okay, I made this little family tree here a while back because I think it's easier, once you get used to the setup of this, I think it's easier to see how everybody fits together. Okay, now look at this up here at the top. Can you see up here's Philip the Third. Now, the people who are directly connected to someone by a line, like from this downward, that means that they are the children. So Philip III has mm -hmm. two sons that we need to know. There's Philip the Fair over here, the guy that just dies here in 1314, and then his brother, Charles of the Lull. Now, Philip the Fair, Philip the Fourth, has one, two, three, four children. Okay, he has Louis, Philip, Charles, and Isabella. Now, Philip the Fair has these four children, which means that when he dies in 1314, who should the throne go to? The first one. The oldest son. 
oldest son. Now you're going to see here in a few minutes why France has never had a queen. Again, I always remind you, no, Marie Antoinette was not a queen. She was a queen consort. She was queen only in the sense that she married a king, or the man she married became a king. She had no power on her own. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to see why that happened though in France here in just a minute. Now, you have Philip the Fair dying, and the, the crown <coughs> went to his brother, who became Louis X. Now, he's sickly. He's going to reign for only two years, Louis X. So let's go back here. Okay, that's the oldest son of Philip. He took the throne. Now, once he died, Louis X had no children. Okay, had no children. So if Louis X has no children, where does it go from there? He has no sons. Where does it go? Here's your brother. Okay, what? What are you saying? I can help you. What is it? I got confused. I thought these were birth and death dates. I'm like, how did I get born after he died? Oh, oh, oh. yeah, good, good point. I didn't put the R on there. That's a good point. Yeah, these are their, um, these down here anyway, these are the reigns. Yeah, these are the reigns. Yeah, when they were in power. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, those are all, yeah, those are all reigns. I was like, wait a minute. And here's another thing that might confuse you right here if you're paying attention. Right here. I didn't make that box wide enough. This is going to be Philip the Sixth. You see the little eye down there? You kind of knocked it down to the next line. That's actually Philip the Sixth, but we'll get to him. But yeah, so yeah, those are the reigns. Those are the reigns. So anyway, Philip, if, if, if he dies, it goes to his son. And then his son, though, it should go to his son's firstborn son. But Louis the Tenth doesn't have any, any children. So when he dies, it goes to, whoops, there's the next guy in line. That's Philip the Fifth. Okay, he's, he's in power for a few years, and he does. Now, Philip V, let's go back here again, do them together. Philip V dies in 1322. Philip has, I don't know, maybe three daughters. Philip V has three daughters, I believe, two or three. And what happens is they completely overlook the daughters. Nope, don't need, don't need a daughter. We need the next man in line. Okay. So what they did right there in 1322, it could have gone a different way, but they chose not to. What they did was they set a male precedent. We're not going to accept, like, you know, in England, right at this moment, we mentioned this before, we have a queen. Okay? Did you hear Prince Harry's getting married? Yeah. I'm so happy about oh, that. I'm so, so happy about that. I love the I love the British royal. It's a story. Their story was not as scary to tell her man. I mean, that it is. It's a whole. I mean, it's a whole other story. And she's also going to be the first. Um, I think mixed. Um, you know, mixed yeah. uh, race. Um, you know, that. royal and so on. Yeah. There's all sorts of cool stuff going on. With I, I love. I like to say I love my British royals. I think they're fascinating. Even though I think they're they're. I hate to say it, I think they're blood suckers as far as the money goes, but I still love them. They're just kind of magnificent in their own way. But anyway, Charles the Fourth, his brother, becomes king over the daughters. Okay, we're not going to allow a queen. And why? Well, yeah, you know, we just don't want one. Okay, so there's a precedent. There's something to be said for that. Let's say you give your kid, this is precedent, that's fine. Let's say one day, um, just because you're lazy or tired or something, you tell your kids, like, can I eat that popcorn for breakfast? And you're like, sure, I'm tired. Just go eat your popcorn for breakfast. Then the next day or something, you know, they'll come in there and they'll say, can I have that popcorn for breakfast or whatever? No, are you crazy? Let me get up and go make you. But you let me get popcorn. You see what I mean? Precedent is something that has been said. It means that we're probably going to do it that way, or there's a reason why we did it that way. It's going to be hard to break out of that once we get into that model without a good reason. Now, in this case, okay, Philip, his daughters have been overlooked, and here's Charles. Now, Charles, from 1322 to 1328, is on the throne, and he dies. Now, Here's the problem. Charles has no heirs to the throne. And here's the problem. I mean, the huge problem. When Charles IV dies, who is next in line? Well, it's a woman. Oops, there's the sister. Sister is a okay, brother, 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 uh-oh. <laughs> okay, there's a girl. We can't have her. First of all, she's married to the king of England. She's over in England. 
Okay, even though she's the daughter of a French king and the sister of three former French kings, she's over in England. And, you know, her husband, Edward II, is king of England. But she does have a son who will become Edward III, king of England. Now, if you're looking at it logically, it goes from this guy to this guy to this guy. You're like, well, you know, we don't want you because you're a woman, but you do have a son. He's next in line, right? He's closest, right? He's the nephew of Charles IV. He is the next male in the line, right? He is. I mean, that's not a trick question. He is the next male in line. But. He is literally, but, yeah, always, but, okay, Isabella <coughs> is going to be the, what is that, fly in the ointment or something, right? The fly in the soup or something. You can't do that. Well, you could have, but here's what they did. They said, well, you know, and this is the problem. It's, it's not as simple as you might think it is. It's not just that they don't want it to go through Isabella. It's that she is married to the king of England. Therefore, her son will become the next king of England. Therefore, England and France would have the same king. They do not want to be taken over by England. Does that make sense? That's what they're trying to prevent. They don't want a foreigner okay, in control of their government. So, Edward III was the nephew of the last king of France. He was next. According to feudal law, he's next. According to every bit of common sense, he's next. Okay, I'm on his side. He was next. Okay. But the French do not want him because he will become, I don't think he had it that time, but he will become king of England. So what are we going to do? Well, if we want to, we can just say, we don't want him. We don't want him. But that, that's not tradition. We can't, we can't just change the traditions of our government midstream. I mean, then who knows what's going to happen next, right? So what they do is they go back. They go way back. They go back to the time of Clovis. Remember, he died in 511. And they go back to Salian Franks, to what we call Salian Law. And it said, male rulers only. Well, so what? He's a male ruler. Edward. Edward III is still the closest male relative, but it was more specific than that. It said it cannot pass through the lineage of a king's daughter to her son. It has to be an unbroken male line. In other words, it has to be this guy and he has a son and then that son has a son and then this guy has a son and so on and so forth. Or if it goes to your brother, that brother has to have a son or whatever. As soon as there is a woman in that mix, as far as the, you know, passing of the, of the family title or the lineage, it's going to stop. Now look, let me show you this back here. Okay, it goes like this. It goes, okay, male to my son, the male. Then one more, and then one more. We ignore the daughters here. We didn't make a big deal about it at the time, but we ignored them. Okay. Then we go here, male. Then we go here, and we're like, eh, 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 can't go any further. Okay, so can't go any further. What now? It's going to jump over to Charles. Well, <coughs> what they're going to do is they're going to have to actually climb back up the family tree. Okay, they're going to climb back up this tree way back here. They're going to say, all right, where's the unbroken line of men? Now, again, we all know the obvious thing is there are women involved in every single one of these creations of these former, these former and present and future kings, right? I mean, duh, there's women involved, but we're talking about the, the lineage, right? So we climb all the way back up here to Philip, and we say, oh yeah, he had another son, Charles of Valois. Well, Charles is old. No, it's not him. His, or he's dead. I can't remember if he's dead or not. But anyway, it comes down to this guy right here, Philip Valois. Now, these two right here, Philip Valois and Edward III, these are the two contenders right here. They are cousins. Okay, they're fathers or brothers. All right, they're fathers. I'm sorry, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, that's right. They're fathers or brothers. No, wait, that's his grandpa. Anyway, they're second cousins. Anyway, Philip Valois is the one who is put forth by the French, you know, Parliament the Council. Now, Edward III says, but I'm actually the next in line. 
and the French say, oh, no, 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 we're quoting ancient Salic law, we can't do this. Now, this causes a problem, okay? This causes an issue, as you might think. So, there's something else going on. There's an area called Gascony in southwestern France that both countries wanted, and both countries actually said they believed it was their own property. Okay, so the English believed they owned it, and the French believed they owned it. Edward III says, you know, we both really want this territory. I'll tell you what, cousin Philip, if you want to be king of France, I will fight you. I will let you accept and become king of France if you give this area of Gascony back to the English, give it back to us, okay? So they make a deal. Edward says, I will not fight you for the throne. You, Philip, can go ahead and become Philip VI, king of France. It's all fine. Just give me that territory. And they agree on that, and all is well, until it isn't, okay? And what happens is England, meanwhile, gets involved in a war with Scotland. Philip, oh, Philip, Philip VI, he's going to betray his cousin. Philip decides that he wants to get that land back, okay? Well, while England is preoccupied with Scotland, you know, fighting Scotland, France actually helps Scotland. And while France is preoccupied fighting Scotland, and the French are helping the Scots win, then eventually it would win. But the French go in and they invade Gascony and take it back. Remember, that was the whole crux of the whole thing. Edward III says, I will not fight you if you give me that land. Well, now... Philip the sixth has taken it back. Who's going to trust him again? Edward the third comes out and says, listen, basically, I was the legal heir to this throne anyway. How dare you take back that land? You have betrayed me. You've betrayed the family. And they declared war. Okay, by the end of 1337, England and France are at war. Now, it's not just because of Gascony, it's because of the, the betrayals, it's because of all of the, you know, the, the lineage things and so on. There's a lot of factors here. What happens, though, there's the area of Gascony. You see it's down here bordering Spain. It's a very, very rich area. It's very easy to grow things there. It's a beautiful area that both of them want. Now, what follows is not 100 years of constant battle, okay? You're going to have five English kings and five French kings. Now, let's get through this part, and then we'll, this little part right here, we should be able to get done because we've got about four minutes, I think. Now, the important early battles you need to know, Battle of Slides or Slaves, is in 1340. <coughs> this is where the French fleet was almost completely destroyed. This is a naval battle, and what we see here is in the beginning, I mean, England is winning. England is winning. They are just plowing through all of this. England took control of the whole English Channel. That's important because, remember, the English have the great navy. They have to. They're the island nation. Now, Battle of Crusade and Battle of Cali, those are important because it continues that, that, you know, that, that momentum of gaining control of not only the English Channel, but in this point, they're moving into part of France. Okay? Now, Battle of Poitiers, 1356, this one's really important, okay? This is the English victory by Edward the Black Prince. He always wore black armor, that's why I called himself that. He's the son of Edward III, okay, the English, um, English monarch. He's the son of Edward III, the English monarch. Well, let me tell you this, this is the best part right here, finish this, okay? So here we have, right here, the Battle of Poitiers in 1356, we have the English king, I mean, I'm sorry, the French king, who is captured. This is John the Good, John II of France. And he's a Valois king, and so on, he's captured, it's a battle, he signed a treaty. Here's what's important about him, okay? I wish I felt like walking, this is a good story to walk. Give me a second, I take a couple minutes extra, but it won't be much. All right, this guy has been captured by the English, John the Good. Now, what they do is they capture him, and you think, well, you know, the war is over, they've captured the king. Well, what the English do is they ask the French for ransom. They say, we're holding your king for ransom. And then John the Good hears how much money they're asking from the French. And he says, I, I'm not making this up, I swear I'm not. He says, you're not asking for enough money for me. I'm worth more than that. So he wants his ransom raised. And so... The French people, they're like, or the English people, they're like, okay. And so they ask for more money from France. Well, the French government comes back and says, 
we don't have that kind of money to pay for our king. Are you insane? Well, John the Good says to the English, his captors, he says, I'll tell you what, I'll go back to France and I will raise my own ransom. Somebody tell me what's wrong with that. Yeah, you know what's wrong with that. Okay. So he's going to go, well, he's gonna go raise his own ransom, but here's the thing. He had his son, Louis, captured with him. He says, I will leave my son, Louis, as collateral. I'm going to go to France, I'm going to raise the money, I'm going to come back, I'm going to claim my son, pay you, and we'll be free. And his son states that, Louis, they let him go back to get his own ransom. Now, what happens, though, this is the funny part, is his son ends up escaping from the English. He comes back to France, and he says to his dad, I'm, I'm making this part up, but he, he escapes from the English, that's true. He comes back to France, walks into the palace, and says to his father, I'm home. And his father's like, why are you here? You're supposed to be collateral. You've shamed the family. John the Good goes and turns himself in to the English. He says, I'm sorry, my son escaped. He betrayed us. You know, he betrayed our family and so on, brought shame on us. And he says, you know what? I'm turning myself in. He turned himself in to the English, and they kept him. As a folk hero, he became a folk hero in England for the rest of his life. So, would you believe that? I would you do that? I can no. picture that being like a Monty Python skin or a Bloomington It's kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. So just remember for him. Now, next time, we'll start this. We'll finish up the Hundred Years War, and then we'll do the Black Death. And then we're done with Chapter 10. Well, I think it's just how when I miss notes, and I, I'm trying to run into that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I got it recorded for you. So um, hopefully you guys can hear.